Hello, and welcome to another episode of Morgan's Pop Talks, breaking down the latest in reality TV and pop culture, and I'm stressed the heck out right now. We've had technical difficulty after technical difficulty after technical difficulty, and here I am trying to record the pod. David and I just spent, I'm not joking, an hour trying to set up a a different setup, which I don't know why we waited until an hour before I was actually supposed to record for today's episode to try this out. Uh, but we did just to end up putting it back exactly how it was in the first place. You know, have you ever been there? Have you ever been there? And this is how I know I'm growing as a person. The tension was getting high. Things were getting heated. I was getting frustrated. And instead of losing it, I was like, I just need to take a break. Walked outside sat on my front porch, took a five, came back in, and then my microphone stopped working. So (laughs) send some T's and P's your girl's way. I know you did last week because we were also going through hell on earth last week, power outage for six days. Thankfully, thankfully, the power came back on at my house on Saturday night. So we are home. We are in our beloved little home. I fixed my eyebrows, so I'm no longer having a bad eyebrow week. So I guess you just have to take it as it comes, you know, roll with the punches, the ones and the twos. Some weeks you have power outages and bad eyebrows and other weeks you can't get your microphone to work. So, you know, it's a circle of life. It's how you navigate through the difficult times that make you who you are. My dog Harley is in the room. Um, I think he has some type of allergy because the boy will not stop gnawing at his feet like a chicken wing. Like literally how my nine-year-old eats chicken wings, that is how Harley, my dog, gnaws at his feet. And he knows I'm talking about you. I'm sorry, buddy. He's looking at me with the biggest puppy dog eyes ever right now. I swear to God, though, if you start licking your feet, I'm going to lose it. His tongue's coming out and his foot is getting closer. And there he goes. (laughs) And there he goes, as if that's not going to send me over the edge like I already am. All right, let's get into the pop three. We have so much to discuss. And honestly, I'm glad. I was down and out feeling like, what's going on? Nothing is going on. Why is there no drama? Why is there no controversy? Why is there not even any shows, really? But in the past week, things have absolutely popped off. And we're going to talk about all of it, starting with the Bachelor announcement. Let's start with the Bachelor announcement. So I've been on a bit of a rampage this week about the way that they announced The Bachelor. In case you missed it, Grant Ellis will be the next Bachelor. He was eliminated in this week's episode of The Bachelorette. So he got eliminated right before Hometowns. Um, He told Jen that he was falling in love with her. You know, he was really vulnerable and trusting the process and what have you. And let me be abundantly clear. I'm not mad about the pick, right? It's a good pick because I feel like he comes across as sincere. You know, I do believe that he wants to find love. Um, I mean, as sincere as you can, like being on The Bachelorette at this particular, in 2024, you know what I mean? But the way that they announced this was totally bizarre. They literally just tossed it out like the t-shirt cannons at basketball games that you go to. They're like, oh, here's Grant, you know, let's see how the audience receives it. I thought it was very bizarre because there was absolutely no buildup. There was no hype. There wasn't even a mention of it at the end of the episode. You know how I found out that Grant Alice was the next Bachelor? I opened my Instagram and I saw an Us Weekly article that said the next Bachelor is dot, dot, dot. When someone who is actively watching and reporting on the franchise doesn't find out from the show or from the show's accounts who the next Bachelor is, big problem, in my opinion. And I just feel like There's been a lot of people with a lot of different theories in my DMs, one being that it was about to be leaked and they wanted to get it out there. But I mean, like even it being leaked would have been more exciting than what they did for Grant. Other people are like, well, they did the same thing with Clayton. It was kind of out of the blue. They were like, here's Clayton with these puppies and he's your next bachelor. But I also feel like his season was spoiled a little bit because there were photos online on Reddit um, and all of these other things. So Robert Mills got on, I guess, X, Twitter, whatever you call it these days, 
And he said, we're announcing Grant so quickly so people can still apply to be on his season. If you think Grant is potentially the man of your dreams or you know someone who is, apply ASAP. I do not buy it. I do not buy it whatsoever. You're telling me that you didn't know when filming was going to start, that you didn't know what time frame you had to cast the season. If that's the case and you want people to apply as quickly as possible, at the end of last week's episode, you say, by the way, we're announcing the next Bachelor soon. I'm just totally bamboozled by it. And you know, there are people out there that say the Bachelor franchise is dying. And sometimes I hold that opinion to be true. And I just feel like if your franchise is dying, the last thing you want to do is put The Bachelor in a t-shirt cannon and shoot it out to the audience. To not even announce it on television, to post an Instagram reel with a countdown. And I know if they've done it before, I think they did it for Hannah Brown, but it was at the end of after the final rose, or it wasn't after the final rose, I think it was the women tell all where they're like, go to our Instagram page right now and find out none of that. So I'm just very, very confused. Not only that to announce all of Jones men the day after. And did you see their content? Did you see their photo shoots? Grant didn't even get a photo shoot. I'm pretty sure I saw him send in his own little video to the today show that was blurry and pixelated because he had to upload it to the Google Doc or the Google Drive and email it to them. Like not even a proper interview, nothing. And I just feel like it makes me sad for Grant. And I have no idea, no idea what their thought process was unless they were trying to incite a reaction like this, you know? Oh, how are we going to get people to talk about the new season? Let's do something totally crazy and outlandish for the announcement to get people to be all riled up and mad because, you know, I'm all riled up and mad. Also, I'm just wondering, did they think that none of the final four would be contenders? I think Jonathan would be a really good bachelor if he doesn't end up with Jen and I'm not spoiled. So please don't spoil me. And I also am not in the Reddit rabbit holes because I know some of y'all are and y'all are trying to ruin things for me by, you know, digging up all the stuff from the past and the exes and the girlfriends and the exes and like all the things. And I'm like, please just let me live in ignorance for once in my life. Let me enjoy watching this show because it's hard at this current state of the franchise to enjoy it. Although I will say like I am super excited for The Golden Bachelor. I think The Goldens are what is saving The Bachelor franchise right now. And I just also feel like the it factor for the leads is kind of gone. Like I'm sorry, no offense, but you can't tell me that Zach Shalcross has the it factor. You just can't. I mean, I look back to the glory days, like the stretch of Andy Dorfman, Caitlin Bristow, JoJo, Rachel Lindsay, Becca, Hannah Brown, glory days, glory days. And I just don't feel like we will ever get back there. And the, the sad part about it is that I don't even know if Grant does have the it factor or not because we barely saw any of him, right? Like I said, I do think he seems authentic. I do think that he showed his vulnerability. So, I mean, that's a plus for him. It's a good sign. He's not Sam, Sam M, right? I mean, have any of us checked his family's Facebooks? Is there any hashtag I stand with Sam's after this week? I surely hope not. Okay. I feel like that's got to be the last time I talk about this because it's really just made my blood boil for the past couple of days and I'm leaving it all out there. Let's move on to headline number two. Stassi Schroeder is returning to reality TV. I never thought we would see the day. Honestly, I thought it was done. I thought she was never going to return, but she is returning in a different way than we expected. So this was reported by Deadline last week that Stassi is working on two projects. One being on uh, Vanderpump Villa, which is a Hulu show, season two, season one debuted last year. Um, Lisa Vanderpump has this villa. It's like Sir, but in a different country, kind of. Um, And then also Stassi getting her own show called Stassi Says. It's a 30-minute like docu-comedy series. And here's the official log line. 
Endlessly relatable, utterly hysterical, and questionably sane, Stasi is the anchor of a fresh ensemble of comedic and chaotic characters who are dealing with identity crisis, crises, crises, crises. Yeah, great. Somebody else is going to call me dumb in the comment section. Anyways, in major life crossroads of their own, and Stasi is the one who has to keep them all afloat. Okay, so it kind of sounds like the valley a little bit, in my opinion, but. Stassi Says was created by Stassi Schroeder, former Vanderpump Rules producers Aaron Foyer and Jenna Rosenfeld, and will be executive produced by Scout Productions along with Foyer, Rosenfeld, and Schroeder. So Stassi does get a producer edit in this show, which I feel like a lot of reality stars are wanting more of these days. I feel like you first saw it really with the Kardashians. You know, Jax now has, has a producer credit on The Valley, and now Stassi is having a producer credit on this new show. Um, my thoughts on it all, I wasn't one of the people that were sitting there like begging for a Stassi Schroeder comeback every single day. I mean, I do think that she makes for good TV, but you know, the show goes on. Um, we obviously haven't seen her on reality television since she was fired from Vanderpump Rules a couple of years ago. I think it's very strategic that Stassi is not returning to Bravo. She is doing Hulu shows. And Stassi had the opportunity to return to Bravo. They approached her to do, to do the Valley and she said no. So I feel like she is sending a message loud and clear. I'm really also kind of confused how Lisa Vanderpump can have a show on Bravo, which is owned by NBC Universal, and also have a show with her name in it, right? With her name in it on Hulu, which is owned by Disney, which is a, a parent company of ABC. I don't really understand. I mean, especially when you look at intellectual property and contracts and all these things, how you can have Vanderpump Rules on one network and Vanderpump Villa on another network. It doesn't make any sense to me. I would love to read her contract because it's very intriguing to me. Um, you know, I, I didn't like season one of Vanderpump Villa. I found it to be just fake, to be completely honest with you. And I don't really like Stassi coming on to Vanderpump Villa to like, I don't know, run the ship also doesn't make me excited to watch Vanderpump Villa. I'm more excited to watch Stassi's show. Stassi says, of course, I will watch both because it's my job and report back to you. But that's how I feel about that. Last but certainly not least, the Love Island reunion taping is this week. So the Islanders are in New York City for the reunion taping, which will be hosted by the one and only Ariana Maddox. I was wondering why they waited so long between the end of the season um, to do the reunion, but I'm glad they did because a lot has transpired within the couples, and I'm pretty sure 99.9% .9 of them are not in the same spot that they were when they left the villa. Uh, going strong, Serena and Cordell, Janae and Kenny, Leah and Miguel, questionable, Nicole and Kenny. Kendall, and then I think broken up Aaron and Kaylor. Kaylor has been <laughs> leaving some crumbs on the internet, posting TikToks saying she needs a revenge dress for the reunion. Also posting TikToks about, you know, her and her single friends going out on the town. To be honest, I'm most interested in seeing what's going on between Kendall and Nicole because they've put out very different narratives. So it's just really mysterious to me. But can I tell you who has surprised me in a good way post Villa is Rob. While everybody else is getting mobbed at Universal Studios and you know they're eating it up and honestly, good for them. Rob is back in Alabama wrangling snakes. And I know, yes, he was in that one music video, but he's like, I just want to go play with ribbon snakes and pythons. And like, that's going to be my influencer lane. And that's how I'm going to make my money. And I'm like, play with the Python in the middle of the street, Rob. Honestly, I respect Rob and his overalls a lot more now, post Villa. I'm kind of here for it. So Janae, Serena, Kaylor, and Liv, they all went to see Ariana in Chicago. And I saw the videos from outside of Chicago. And can I have a hot take? People were swarming these women, screaming. Like you would think it was... Jennifer Aniston and Brad Pitt like walking out of the Empire State Building. It was wild. And like 
I saw that video and I was like, have we gone too far with this? Have we put them too much in the limelight? Like, is it becoming a little bit too much? And at first I was like, yeah, like we have made them too big. But at the same time, I think they deserve it because they gave us, honestly, my favorite reality TV tenure moments of the year. So anyways, also sidebar, Kane will not be at the reunion. He said he was canceled from the reunion. So some speculate that he was uninvited after posting a TikTok video in which he attended a Korean restaurant uh, with Aaron. They toasted saying chin chin, but then Kane adds a G to the end of the phrase and then starts like busting out laughing just really inappropriate and honestly just immature. So according to Deadline, other problematic aspects of the video include Kane mispronouncing the name of the restaurant, calling it Gangnam Style. He also seemingly mocked the use of chopsticks while dining in the restaurant. And then he ends the video saying, love you long time, a phrase used in full metal jacket, which fetishizes Asian women. Can we all agree Kane needs a swift reality check in his life? I don't know who needs to be the one to do it, but somebody out there needs to get this, get a hold of yourself, Kane. Like, what are you thinking? What are you doing? 99.9% of the things that come out of your mouth are offensive and rude and not funny and not cute. And it's just weird. It's weird energy. He needs our T's and P's for sure. He needs something. Let's get into the deep dive. We have got to talk about the drama of It Ends With Us, this new movie that was based on the Colleen Hoover book, It Ends With Us. It stars Justin Baldoni and Blake Lively, and there is all types of drama surrounding this press door, and it is giving Don't Worry Darling 2.0. So here we are. Who doesn't love a dramatic press tour? We do love it. Um, So, I mean, the main thing, oh my God, you know, I'm watching too much Bachelor when I say the main thing. And in my head, I said, keep the main thing, the main thing. And now I just want to die. Please, somebody put me out of my misery. Okay. (laughs) Anyways, there is a lot of speculation that the main riff in this movie is between Blake Lively and Justin Baldoni. Justin Baldoni was, is the director, and he also played Ryle, one of the main characters. Um, Blake Lively was a co-star. She played Lily, who also was a main character. So people started noticing that something was wrong when Justin was on an island on his own in the press tour. No pictures with the rest of the cast, no interviews with the rest of the cast cast members wouldn't answer questions about him. So then people started sleuthing on the internet, right? And they found that none of the cast, pretty much none of the cast followed Justin, although he followed everybody else. And we're like, in the year of 2024, if you don't follow somebody on social media, you hate them. And that's just, it is what it is. But the main narrative pushed online is that the big beef is specifically between Justin and Blake and people are choosing sides. From a marketing perspective, there is nothing like beef to promote your movie. It could be the Titanic. It could be the greatest movie of all time. But if you have a movie like this and you have this main beef that involves all types of different co-stars and their stories and their headlines, like you would never get this much press for your movie unless something like this happened. So whether or not they're loving it or hating it, I can guarantee it is positively affecting ticket sales. Because to be completely honest, I've never read the book. I had no intention of seeing it. Now I want to see it. I hate going to the movies. I actually despise it. I get all types of anxiety. I hate listening to people eat popcorn. And I said to David the other day, do you want to go to the movies to see it ends with us? And he was like, you want to go to the movies. And I was like, I have completely lost myself. I don't know who I am anymore. So I'm going to go through different narratives that are being put out there about what specifically happened between Blake and Justin. But what I will say, this is the newest information, and then I'm going to work my way back. So Justin was the first one to acquire the rights to the movie, right? 
through his production company, Wayfair Studios in 2019. Now, Blake Lively is an executive producer. So people have speculated that Blake might have overstepped her boundaries when it came to being a producer and directing. And there's a lot of different, I guess, evidence you could say that kind of correlates with that fan theory. One being that people have been questioning Ryan Reynolds' involvement, her husband, after she credited him for what is being called an iconic rooftop scene. So she said, he works on everything I do. I work on everything he does. So his wins, his celebrations are mine and mine are his. When I read this quote, my first thought was, it's kind of weird, right? Like, don't get me wrong. I'm all for a supportive husband, a supportive relationship, a supportive union, if you will. But to just make a blanket statement, like he works on everything I do and I work on everything he does. Like, I would assume that most directors in Hollywood don't sign up for a package deal when they cast someone in a movie or when they make them a producer. So according to TMZ, and this is where it gets interesting, Blake did hire her own editor and had her husband, Ryan Reynolds, do last minute rewrites on the script, even though this was supposed to be Justin's project. Sources have told The Hollywood Reporter that there was a fracture between Baldoni and Lively in the post-production stage, wherein two different cuts of the movie emerged. Lively commissioned a cut of the movie from editor Shane Reed, who was an editor on Deadpool and Wolverine, her husband's new movie. And also we see like the crossover there. People are saying they're trying to make this a Barbie Oppenheimer moment with Deadpool and Wolverine. And it ends with us, you know, uh, Ryan Reynolds and Hugh Jackman taking photos on the red carpet for it ends with us, stuff like that. So that was according to multiple sources. It continues by saying it was unclear if any of this cut was ultimately used in the final project, which was credited to editors Ona Flannery and Rob Sullivan. So then there's a possibility of a sequel, right? And in one of Justin's interviews, they asked, would you direct the sequel? And this is what he said. I think there are better people for that one. I think Blake Lively is ready to direct. That's what I think. That quote came out before this Hollywood Reporter article and before the TMZ article. So that quote kind of does coincide with that narrative. But On the other hand, there's this other narrative going around. Uh, Industry sources have told Page Six that Baldoni made Lively uncomfortable on set and overall created an extremely difficult atmosphere for everyone involved. A source told People, all is not what it seems. There is much more to this story. The principal cast and author, Colleen Hoover, will have nothing to do with him. So that that one was actually what came out first, right? That Justin Baldoni was the bad guy. And I will be honest with you, whenever I saw these headlines come up at first, the feeling that I got was it was very much giving Joe Jonas and Sophie Turner. And I'm not sitting here saying one person is right and one person is wrong, but it felt like one side was rushing to get their narrative out ahead of time. That's just my personal opinion. And it's hard when it's like these sources, you know, quotes, because you don't know who these sources are. They could be anybody. And Blake Lively and Justin Baldoni could have no idea that someone in their friendship circle is blabbing to page six or whatever. But that's just the way that it kind of came off to me in that moment. Um, However, people also aren't really seeing Blake Lively right now as innocent because of the way that she is approaching this press tour. She's getting a lot of heat online because the movie is about domestic violence and it seems she's avoiding the discussion on that in detail. So there's two clips that I did see of Blake that kind of threw me off. Uh, One being an interview where the interviewer asks her, Blake, you know, this movie is about domestic violence. A lot of women that are going to see it are going to relate to it. They're going to see you on the streets of New York City, and they're going to want to talk to you about their experiences. What would you tell them if they have the urge to do that? And her response was, do you want my address? Do you want my phone number for me to share my location? So she was basically saying, 
don't come up to me. Don't talk to me. You're invading my personal space. You're invading my privacy, which was just a really weird answer. Honestly, like I even feel like there's a way to say, don't come up to me in public without being super condescending like that. And, you know, people are like, well, that's just Blake. She has this sarcastic personality. But I, I was surprised by that reaction. And I had never seen that sarcastic, I guess, if you want to call it, side of Blake Lively. Another interview clip I've seen is of her saying, grab your girlfriends, wear your florals, come see the movie. And people are like, she's making this out to seem like this romantic comedy. And that is not what it is. So she has addressed that backlash on an Instagram story this week. She reshared an interview clip of herself um, talking about Lily saying she's not just a survivor and she's not just a victim. And while those are huge things to be, they are not her identity. Lily is not defined by something someone else did to her or an event that happened to her, even if it's multiple events. She says she defines herself, and I think that's deeply empowering. No one else can define you. No experience can define you. You define you. So then she posted that and she added some text on an Instagram statement saying, thank you to everyone who came out to show that people want to see films about women in the multitudes we hold. It ends with us as the story of the female experience, all the highest highs and the lowest lows, and we are so proud of it. We have been in celebration of this film and getting a message so important out there to the masses. Thank you all for embracing It Ends With Us movie with the same pain, love, and joy we had sharing it with you all. Then she shared statistics on intimate partner violence as well as a link for the hotline and access to immediate help. So before I popped on here again, there was another headline. And like I said, it's very much so giving Joe Jonas and Sophie Turner where there seems to be two sides of the story. Um, before I got on here, I saw a TMZ article say that um, Blake thought that he fat shamed her. Uh, there's one particular scene where he lifts her up in the air. And I guess he had asked somebody, I don't know if it was another producer, how much weight did she gain? Because I need to make sure that I can um, get strong enough to lift her. That's basically, I'm paraphrasing, but that was the sentiment. And also the source said that she felt like a kiss on camera lingered a little bit too long. Okay. I didn't write it in my notes. That's just, I'm just going off the brain flow here, but According to TMZ, there are people who are siding with Blake, but also people who feel like Justin got screwed. So it says, the sources we spoke to felt Blake was eager to be seen as a creator, and that's why she tried to seize creative control of the film from Justin. We're also told he's over the drama and looking to put it all in his rear view, which is why he suggested last week Blake should direct the sequel. Justin has spoken about the friction and has hired a PR crisis veteran, Melissa Nathan, who represented Johnny Depp during the Amber Heard trial. So the latest interview that Justin did with LUK, he mentions the friction between the cast. He says, there are all these things that happen every day on set. There's always friction that happens when you make a movie like this. Then at the end of the day, it's the friction, I believe, that creates the beautiful art. Everything in life needs friction to grow. We created something so beautiful and so magical, and it was hard, and it was worth it at the same time. And I grew so much as both a filmmaker and actor and as a person throughout this experience. Wow. I just feel like I shot my own documentary. Like, I feel like get Netflix on the phone, take the deep dive, put some B roll to it, and you just got a complete and total breakdown of the It Ends With Us drama. Don't you feel smarter? I feel smarter. I don't really know what to make of it. I don't really know what to believe. I said a couple days ago coming into it that historically, Justin Baldoni and Blake Lively have been like beloved in the Hollywood sphere, right? Seemingly unproblematic. People like the work that they're in, whether it's Jane the Virgin or Gossip Girl or the Sister of the, Tra Sister of the Traveling Pants. So I just feel like this is just kind of like a punch to the gut for all of us because we don't know what to think. And sometimes that's okay. Let's move on to our final thoughts. We had two trailers drop this week, Selling Sunset and The Real Housewives of New York. So let's get into Selling Sunset first. It's coming back on September 6th, which is so exciting. It's so soon. I love that we don't have to wait that long. 
And here's who's coming back. Chriselle, Mary, Emma, Amanda, Chelsea, Brie, and Nicole Young with a newbie, Alana Whitaker-Gold. She's a model and a real estate agent. Um, and some of the interesting things in the trailer, Nicole says that there's drama that could affect marriages, families. But we can all assume that a lot of this season is going to be about Chelsea, her husband, and her divorce. So they are currently going through a divorce, and it appears that we get some of the cast reaction to that divorce on camera. You know, Chriselle is seen gasping and looking at her phone, saying, oh my gosh, can you believe this? And I feel like that might be the moment that we all read it on TMZ, that Chelsea is getting a divorce from her husband, Jeff. I think it's going to be a big story because the divorce is messy, right? There's all kinds of allegations going on, allegations of Jeff's infidelity. He also said in court documents that he filed that Chelsea has demonstrated that she is capable of being physically violent, alleging about a year ago she struck him in the face, breaking his glasses and causing a small cut on the side of his face allegedly. That's in court docs filed by Jeff. So I think that is going to be huge. Obviously, we ended the last season on a big cliffhanger, whether or not Brie was going to quit the Oppenheim group or come back. I mean, I think it's pretty obvious that she came back. And that's that. Then we get Roni. Real Housewives of New York, the reboot season two. So we have season one under our belt. We have the characters defined. Um, everyone is coming back. Bryn, Sai, Jessel, Aaron, Uba, Jenna, and then um, joining is Rebecca Minkoff. So it starts with Jessel getting scared of some pigeons walking around through New York City. And you guys, Jessel got new teeth. And I just wish people would stop getting new teeth. Your teeth are fine. Your teeth are fine. Stop messing with your teeth. People, please leave them alone. I mean, she's gorgeous no matter what. It doesn't really matter, but she just didn't need it. She did not need to do that, but she did it anyways. There is some controversy surrounding Rebecca Minkoff and her affiliation with Scientology. We see in the trailer that she dodges the question. I believe it's Bryn asks her, you know, if somebody asks us about the Scientology stuff, what do we say? To which Rebecca responds, no comment. So I think that Bravo kind of gets in these patterns sometimes when they see something that works in one show and they kind of copy and paste it onto another show. For example, two big reveals that happened on Housewives finales this year, Monica being unmasked as Reality Von Teese, and then you turn around to New Jersey and Jackie is unmasked as the one that was talking to Louis X. Another example, the cast of Vanderpump Rules watching the final scene of uh, the season together at the reunion, copy and paste to The Real Housewives of New Jersey, watching the finale together and giving commentary instead of doing their own reunion. So what's my point? I think that controversial characters are good for ratings, whether it be Erica Jane in 2020, all of us glued to the TV trying to find out what she knew about Tom Girardi, whether it be Jen Shaw being arrested and sentenced. And now let's plop in Rebecca Minkoff, who is associated with Scientology. People like controversy, people like scandal, people want to see, they want to know, like, what is she about? What does she believe? Will she talk about it? Um, But, you know, regardless of of your personal feelings about it, it makes the show interesting. It just does. I mean, I hate that it that it takes stuff like that to get us to be like, oh, we got to watch this, but it's just the way that we're wired, I guess. Someone is pregnant. Jessel is seen saying she had this wild night and ended up getting pregnant by some other guy. I have a feeling that this is a bait and switch. This is a little dupe. And that it's not actually any of the main cast members because I feel like we would know by now if one of them were pregnant, Um, but we will see. And then for the last like two minutes, they're just calling each other pigeons. And I didn't necessarily understand, but they really went hard for the bit. They really just put it all out there. You know, um, I haven't. I guess you could say I haven't been the biggest advocate for the rebooted Roni. I just feel like sometimes. It takes me a lot to be invested in people and shows and there's so much to watch and the competition for it is just so strong. I'm like, what makes this Roni, you know, what what's going to make me want to sit down every single week and watch it live? I feel that way about Dubai. Dubai is great, but for some reason, I just can't sit down and watch it, you know, regularly like I do 
like Real Housewives of Atlanta, I am there. I am seated. I'm set. Beverly Hills, same thing. So I don't know. I'm hoping that maybe season two, they'll start to become a little bit more familiar to us. We'll start to feel a little bit more connected to them. Um, because I think it does have like the recipe to be successful. I just think that takes time. So we will see. All right, here comes Harley. He's been licking his paws the whole time. So if I seemed a little out of it, that's why, because the noise was driving me crazy. So I'm going to take him outside. In the meantime, if you haven't left the show a review, please do so. A little five-star boop boop, a little love you like a sis, because you know I do. So we'll see you next week for another episode of MPT. And as always, I love you like a sis. Bye.